Triangles, the life and times of an NFL original team. Season 1, Episode 3, Coming of Age, Part 1. In their early years, the young St. Mary's cadet football team confined themselves to the lighter end of the unofficial weight classes that held in local football. There was no evidence sanctioning body that determined these classes, but it appeared that local teams divided themselves into lightweight or junior and heavyweight or senior divisions, similar to the style of boxers of the day. Teams often had pregame weigh-ins to prove that their players were eligible to play, even, in some cases, publishing the weights of their players. With amateur and semi-pro sports gaining local popularity, the games took on financial significance. Al Jessler, a local business person and sports enthusiast, stepped in for the St. Mary's Cadets, replacing original business manager Billy Slick. Jessler had a reputation as a firm but fair advocate of his club's interests. While the Cadets were a truly independent athletic club, other organizations benefited from business sponsorships. The sponsors' motivations varied. Some took a progressive view of employee well-being and sponsored teams as a way of enhancing morale and employee health. Others saw sponsoring sports as a way to promote their businesses. The rapidly growing Dayton Engineering Laboratories Company, the Delco, fell into the former category. Many people are familiar with the name Delco because of its long association with auto parts like spark plugs. Back in the day, though, it wasn't known as Delco. Locals in the press always referred to it as THE Delco. Company principals Charles F. Kettering and Edward A. Dees were civically-minded progressive men to be sure. However, the real advocate for employee recreation programs was probably Forrest Burley McNabb, also known as F.B. F.B. McNabb came to Dayton in 1910, originally to work for the Delco as a patent attorney. He was the 14th employee of a company whose labor force eventually grew into the thousands. McNabb's concern for his fellow human beings extended beyond just Delco employees, ultimately encompassing the entire local community. Other sponsors of local sports saw their participation as good for business. Prominent among these was the Olt Brothers Brewing Company. They sponsored men's and women's sports teams throughout the city as a way to promote their flagship beer brand, Olt's Superba. Eventually, support became outright control of several teams, in January 1912, a group associated with Olds Superba incorporated the Olds Superba Shiloh Baseball and Amusement Company. Among the teams under their control was the Oakwoods, perennial semi-pro champions of Dayton football. While the economics of football were changing in response to its increasing popularity, the rules of the game were evolving in response to a key driver of that popularity, the forward pass. Before 1912, there were limits on how far you could throw the ball. Furthermore, balls thrown past the goal line resulted in a touchback for the opposing team. A receiver could not run past the goal line to catch a thrown ball because the area past the goal line was out of bounds. In 1912, Walter Camp proposed, and the Intercollegiate Rules Committee approved, two key changes to liberalize the passing game. The first change removed the limitation on how far a passer could throw the ball, opening up the possibility of exciting long pass plays. The second, and by far most important historically, was the creation of the end zone. The pre-1912 American football field was a rectangle 160 feet wide and 330 feet, 110 yards, in length. Everything outside that rectangle was out of bounds. The proposed end zone was an area extending 10 yards past each goal line 
and equal in width to the rest of the field. A receiver in the end zone would still be considered to be within the field of play, that is, in bounds, and could catch a pass, which would result in a touchdown for the offensive team. Adding the end zones created an unforeseen problem, though. Some venues, such as baseball fields, couldn't contain a gridiron 20 yards longer. To accommodate the smaller parks, the committee shortened the length from goal line to goal line from 110 yards to 100 yards. This change, in turn, made it necessary to change the spot of kickoffs and touchbacks. Kickoffs, which had traditionally been from midfield, then the 55-yard line, moved back to the kicking team's 40-yard line. Touchbacks moved from the 25-yard line to the 20-yard line. These changes would play to the strengths of the young St. Mary's cadets. First, though, they needed games. The cadets faced a watershed year in 1912. After dominating the local competition and the junior classes in their first years of existence, they practiced and sought out opponents, but found the competition scarce. Although many of the players were sidelined, a few, notably Al Mart and Norb Saxtetter, competed on the St. Mary's Collegiate Squad. In the early days of semi-professional football, players often performed double duty, playing for colleges on Saturdays and semi-pro teams on Sundays. There were no meaningful rules against this kind of double dipping and the amount of money one could earn playing semi-professionally did not provide a significant temptation to become a full-time professional as it did in later years. Norb's brother Hugh Saxtetter played the 1912 season at halfback for the Olds Superba Oakwoods. While things were slow in Dayton in 1912, in Connecticut, it was a banner year for Nelson Strobridge Bud Talbot who was beginning to make his mark at left tackle with the Yale University varsity. Nelson was the second son of industrialist Harold Talbot, and his standout performance in the Yale-Princeton game was front-page news in Dayton. His parents attended the game as part of the Yale cheering section for the contest at Princeton. 1913 brought tragedy. In late March of that year, heavy rains caused massive flooding in Dayton, submerging downtown and other areas. Among the many catastrophes, fire burned Almar's family home. The stress of flood and fire took a heavy toll on Al's father, John, whose health declined in the months that followed. The city of Dayton designated Harold Talbot to be chief engineer directing the cleanup of the city streets after the floodwaters receded. Ohio Governor James M. Cox appointed Talbot and industrialist John H. Patterson colonels in the state quartermaster's department in recognition of their relief efforts. This was no mere honorarium. The quartermaster's department is the state government entity that runs Ohio's National Guard to the present day. From then on, Press accounts frequently referred to the elder Talbot as Colonel Talbot. After the floodwaters of 1913 receded, Dayton gradually recovered and life returned to normal. By autumn, with many of their best players now out of college, the St. Mary's cadets were ready to test themselves against the best senior competition Dayton and the region had to offer. Manager Jessler put out the word in the run-up to the 1913 season. His hope, stated to the Dayton Daily News, was, quote, to work his team up to the point where it will give the Oakwoods a run for the city championship before the season is over, end quote. Taking up residence at Highland Park, southeast of downtown, for their home games, the cadets would feature Mart at quarterback, the Saxtetter brothers at halfbacks, and Babe Zimmerman at fullback. Lewis Foose Clark, 
coaching both the independent cadets and the St. Mary's collegiate team, would hold down one of the guard positions. The cadets' first test came against a squad from Newcastle, Indiana. The Newcastle team, like many in the day, consisted of factory workers in the team's hometown. In this case, the opposition hailed from the Maxwell Motor Car Company, with support from the organization, including workers from the Dayton Maxwell dealership cheering them on. It hardly mattered in the end. The cadets passed their first test easily, wrecking Newcastle 65 to nothing. The team followed its opening win with an equally easy romp over a highly touted Cincinnati YMI team. Norb Saxtetter scored three touchdowns and Zimmerman two in the 46 to nothing victory. Despite a stumble the following week, the cadets handled Christ Church of Cincinnati 21 to seven. The Cincinnati team's score came off a marked fumble and represented the first points ever scored against the cadets. On the eve of what the Daily News billed as the club's biggest test yet against a strong team from Marion, Indiana, Al Mart's father passed away. John had never recovered from the stress of the flood and fire earlier in the year. His death followed closely the death of his brother Herman, compounding the tragedy. Only a few days later, Al's cousin Gretchen, Herman's only daughter, also passed away at the tender age of 13. Despite Al Mart's absence due to bereavement, there was still a game to be played, and the cadets would have to find a way to persevere without their field general. To make matters worse for the cadets, they had to overcome the loss of Norb Saxtetter and pass catching and Billy Zile to injuries during the Marion game. Babe Zimmerman stepped up to spark the passing game and the defense proved stout in the cadets' 14 to nothing victory. Zimmerman threw a touchdown pass to Ernie Dungan and a long pass from Zimmerman to Zile prior to the latter's injury set up another score. The defense kept Marion off the board and the cadets improved to 4-0 against the best competition Jessler could book. The time had come to challenge the champion Oakwoods. Hi, I'm Bruce. If you're enjoying this episode of Triangles, please head over to DaytonTrianglesPodcast.com for news, episodes, and maybe some extras. And while you're there, please consider clicking the donate button to kick in a few bucks. I'd really appreciate it. Hope to see you at DaytonTrianglesPodcast.com. It had become customary for contending teams in town to issue their challenges publicly. The simplest way to do this was to publish an open letter on the social media of the day, the local newspapers. Thus, on November 6, 1913, the following item appeared in the Daily News. Mr. Harry Huckins, I would like to meet you regarding a game to be played between the Oakwoods and the St. Mary's Cadets. The showing the cadets have made this season, I believe, almost forces you to consider us as able opponents. And as I have November 16th open on my schedule, I would like to make an appointment with you at your earliest convenience in regard to the above date. Yours in sport, signed Al G. Jessler, Manager, St. Mary's Cadets. Huckins' response to Jessler the following day was polite and businesslike, but perhaps a bit condescending. For one thing, he misspelled Jessler's name. Mr. Al G. Jessel, Manager Cadet. Dear Sir, in reply to your challenge to me regarding a game between the Oakwoods and the Cadets for the Independent Championship of the City, we'll state we have no game scheduled for November 16th. We were just about to close with the Shelby Blues, but we'll hold this date open for you. I will be glad to meet you at the Hotel Phillips Friday evening, and if satisfactory arrangement can be made, the game will be played on the date named. Respectfully, signed, Harry Huckins, Manager of Oakwoods. With the challenge issued and accepted, the managers met as agreed at the Phillips that Friday to negotiate terms and conditions. The four-story Hotel Phillips, opened in 1852, 
was located in the heart of downtown Dayton at the corner of 3rd and Main Streets, and locals regarded it as the social center of the city. Elite citizens of Dayton often gathered there, and important visitors who came through town often stayed there. It was extremely popular with jurists and attorneys because of its location directly across the street from the old courthouse, which still stands in what is now called Courthouse Square. The hotel was not actually a single structure, but an architectural hodgepodge that the Dayton Daily News once called the House of a Thousand Buildings. In its heyday, the dining room was the stuff of legend, and its bar and billiard room drew young men throughout its history. It was a natural venue to conclude this business. The managers, though, failed to reach an accord in their initial meeting at the Phillips that Friday. The chief sticking point was division of the gate receipts. The Dayton Journal reported that Huckins and Wilbur Haynes, representing the Oakwoods, initially demanded 70% of the gate, while agreeing to cover all expenses. Based on a projected paid attendance of 2500 and admission price of $0.50 cents per ticket, the cadets would only receive $375 for the game, an amount they considered far too low. Their negotiators, who besides Jessler included Lewis Clark, Al Mart, and Harry Salomano, countered with a demand for a larger share of the receipts, in return for which the cadets would cover 60% of the expenses. After arguing back and forth and even discussing a winner-take-all proposal, the two sides reached an impasse and agreed to think things over. They returned to the Phillips the following day and ironed out a compromise. The cadets and Oakwoods would split the gate receipts on a contingency basis. If the Oakwoods won the game, they would receive 60%. If the cadets won or the two teams tied, the split would be an even 50-50. Apparently skeptical that local officials could perform impartially, the clubs agreed to contact two officials based in Cleveland about handling the game. Papers were drawn up and signed. Each team posted a $100 forfeit bond. And the game for the city championship of football, estimated by that time to be the biggest football game played in Dayton, Ohio in many years, was on. Next time, a wild finish and a captain and his coach form a bond in Canada. Triangles, the life and times of an NFL original team. Written and produced by Bruce Edward Smith. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.